thank you very much, Min. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers of uh, yes. this conference. Yes, Gerard. So um, I'm very delighted to be here, and I think uh, um, to keep up uh, on organizing such meetings is extremely important during these times. So I would like very much to praise this um, this uh, opportunity and to keep up doing research and so that life can continue. Anyway, um, today I would like to uh, present to you this work. It's a joint work with uh, Sanjay of Queen Marie. So can I draw a little? Why can't I see my, yes, Sanjay. Yes, from Queen Mary University of London. You can find the main um, things here on this archive paper that appears recently, but you made it also these two paper to understand better if you want the detail and some of the theorem that I will present you today. So as I have many to say, I will just move to the next slide. Uh, isn't it just my arrows that m make it moving? So hold on. I cannot move the screen. Is it? Isn't it just moving with the arrows that make it moving? Yes, yes, we see we see the arrow moving. Okay, good. So here, so good. Um, now I have some. Can I? I think it erase, may erase everything here. So the outline of my talk is the, is the following. I will try, of course, to motivate why, what are we doing here? And where does it come from? What is this question about the chronica? And I will try to have an overview in the introduction. Then I will start by setting up our tools, which is a particular algebra, an algebra here, which is also an Hilbert space. And this algebra has a reason from counting graphs. So everything has started from here and um, using permutation, in fact. So counting graph using permutation methods. That was a starting point of this story. And then we will move through three steps for proving our main result, step one, step two, and step three. The first thing is to introduce operators, Hamiltonians, on, um, on, this, uh, on this algebra. Uh, and we will show that these Hamiltonians have some integrality structure mm -hmm. due to the fact that even the structure constraint of this algebra is by itself uh, integral. So this is an important feature that I need to discuss. Um, oops. Oh, it just jumped to... Let me go back. We just jump to the, the right thing. So I want to erase this small thing, but I think if I just cannot, so I will move on. Um, so, and then having uh, linear operators that are Hamiltonians on my Hilbert space here, we could discuss something like a quantum mechanical model. So these two things shows you that there is a quantum mechanical, quantum mechanics on that Hilbert space, and that is already interesting. Dear Joseph, uh, yes. we, we see your drawings. Uh, can you clean them? Yes, yeah, so this is what I try to do, but I think ah. as this slide is kind of, uh, is produced from, from the LaTeX, I cannot remove them. I try to by using the eraser here, and, but they, the, oh yes, okay, it works now. Previously it didn't work, but it's okay. Sorry for the disturbance. So yes, uh, so I was saying the step two was to introduce uh, this Hamiltonian. The step three is to conquer, you know, to 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 um, to discuss uh, first of all how do you extract the square of the Kronecker coefficient out of this algebra, and then the Kronecker by itself. And the thing here is here is to find a, an interpretation, a combinatorial interpretation. For, for the Kronecker. And that is a, a long-standing problem that I will just describe before drawing some conclusion here. So let me erase this before it's going uh, to propagate along the slides and move on to the introduction. 
Um, I think it's taking a little lag before it's moving. I don't. It doesn't move, so I think it's making a slight moment before it's moving from one slide to the next. I don't understand why it's not moving for the moment. Do you see the next slide or are you still on the outline? Sorry. Outline, outline. So I, it doesn't move. I don't think, it, I don't know if this is a default of my connection or. So can I, can I escape from here and come back? Mm -hmm. But maybe it is the key you use, the key. Uh, well, okay. you just have to push uh, one arrow, the arrow for moving from one slide to the other. So let me escape this. I think I'm kind of stuck. Okay. Uh, and I don't have any more control in my device. So, so let me first off. Okay, good. It's moving now. Okay. So I think when uh, the, the, the annotation here makes me some trouble. I, I, would, I, I won't be able to use them anyway. So uh, let me push this around and start. Okay, so the Konecker coefficient, what is it? It's, um, it's counting just the multiplicity of an irreducible representation in the tensor product of representation of the symmetry group. Here, Sn is the symmetry group, the group of permutation of M objects, and taking two uh, SPECT module, V mu, a tensor V new, you can expand them back in irreducibles up to, you know, multiplicity, which is your Konecker here. That's my Konecker coefficient. Mu, nu, and lambda are just partition of ends or Young diagrams, they are equivalent. And so here you have this direct somewhere appear with C, which is your, the Konecker coefficients. So, so that's a multiplicity. In a more symmetric way, you can rewrite the same, um, the same object as that average sum of a convoluted product of, of characters. So chi here, chi mu is my character of my symmetry group uh, given, you know, a given partition mu. So it is a long-standing problem to characterize, um, uh, uh, to give a combinatorial rule to understand these conical coefficients. And as they are integers, as we see, we say, we see them here, we see here are nothing but multiplicities, a dimension of multiplicities. So they are just integers, positive integer in fact. So, and as they are integers, positive integer, are they counting some object? So this is a very old problem uh, stated by Murnahan. We are in 1938. So um, this problem has been uh, treated along, uh, you know, along years. For instance, Stanley has stated it in his uh, tenth problem, but here is just using symmetric functions for, you know, for 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 seeing this C appearing. So and he has this comment: often these coefficients, in, in meant by this uh, the C in particular, uh, will have a representation theoretic interpretation such as, such as the multiplicity of an irreducible representation within some larger representation. This is exactly what I described before. Sometimes the only known proof of positivity will be such an interpretation. And the problem will be to find a combinatorial, a combinatorial proof of that. So how do we um, recharacterize combinatorial and, uh, uh, combinatorially uh, the Kornecker? So, and in fact, uh, the Kornecker coefficient is some, an object which is very well studied in theoretical um, computer science, theoretical computational complexity theory, as it is the main object uh, that people um, in the program of geometric uh, complexity theory program of studying. Uh, geometric complexity theory has been introduced by Mulmolen and Sohoni. And one, uh, they tried to answer uh, one of the most famous problem in computer science, which is the, uh, how do you distinguish, how do you separate the classes P and NP? Along the years, many people have contributed to that and uh, in, Still recently, uh, this uh, you know understanding how you can separate the class is still open, of course. But let's have a look about this um, this comment by Pak and Panova. 
saying the following. More importantly, the Kronecker coefficient actually are famously sharply hard to compute and hence be hard to decide if they are non-zero. So one should not expect a closed formula. What makes matters worse, what makes the matter worse, it is a long-standing problem, citing Stanley, to find a combinatorial interpretation of the Kronecker. So it is not even clear what we are counting. Um, in this paper uh, of Sanjay and I, uh, we provide a combinatorial answer to that problem. And in fact, we are, uh, the conical coefficient is counting the dimension, which means vectors uh, of an integer sublattice in the lattice generated by bipartite ribbon graphs with some specific feature that I will of course make precise, uh, regarded as vector spanning a, a given space. So that's what they are counting these conical coefficients. And along my talk, I would like to prove this statement. So let's review our main tool, which is this K and, K and algebra. And actually all that started in theoretical physics and leading us, leading us to combinatorics. And um, as we were interested in counting graphs at the, at the initial level. So, um, uh, I have to say that um, there is permutations methods for counting graph have encountered an, a very in, uh, a success uh, in theoretical physics. Um, in particular, they have been applied to compute multi-matrix correlators in super young mills theory with UN gauge symmetry. A lot of people have worked on that and also for exploring half BBS sector and ads cft correspondence. So the recent paper by Rangulam and Kemp, actually in 2020, would make me, will give you perhaps a kind of a, an overview of what's going on there. So it's a, a well-established method for uh, counting graphs, counting observables. As I was, uh, uh, and, and Sanjay asking some question about enumerations of graphs and observables of unitary tensor model. So this is where we have started. It was 2014 and we have very simple question about how do you enumerate observables of unitary tensor model? So that was a question that we have back then. And we were interested, you can, you may be interesting of tensor of rank three um, and how do you count all observables of, of these types? And we found that actually these observables were in one-to-one -one correspondence with bipartite ribbon graphs. Counting bipartite ribbon graphs, actually, uh, I have to, be, to make uh, things clear here. I'm restricted with a ribbon graph with N edges. And as they are bipartite, I will focus only on, uh, I will say at most N, uh, vertex of a given type, say white, and n vertex of a given white, of a given, of another type, say black. So that's the type of object. Whenever I say in this talk, bipartite ribbon graph, it's at fixed n, at most fixed, uh, at, fix, at fixed n edges, at most fixed uh, n vertices and n black vertices. I hope it's clear, more or less. Okay, so, um, so we were interested to count these type of objects. So what is a bipartite ribbon graph? Well, you can consider it as an equivalence class or an orbit. So take the symmetric group of N objects, take a pair in SN cross SN, right? And now you let act on that couple of permutation of these pairs, you know, the simultaneous adjoint action on both of the slots. All right, so having the entire orbit here is should be uh, oh. seen as you know a ribbon graph. How does it work? So let me just show you. So the construction of the ribbon graph works like this. Um, the cycle of the first element here, sigma one, will be will define vertices of a given type, say black type. The labels in the cyclic order. You know, where you, you draw the label in the cyclic order, they appear in the cycle you want you consider. And then uh, you have to give a unique orientation for all these vertices. Play the same game with sigma two. So you have a second type of vertices, say white, you draw the label in the cyclic order and etc. Then you just have to glue all labels, you know, label by one from one side to the other one, 
the labels uh, given by two from one side to the other one. So this may be a little bit um, too theoretical. So let me, let me give you an example. For instance, this is, um, if you want, the identity. I make here this parenthesis empty for, uh, for, uh, for denoting the identity. So you have here two cycle of length for one. Perhaps here I need my annotation tools. And perhaps this is useful for giving you explicit example. Maybe I can take here another risk to use the, the pencil. Oh, I don't see the mouse anymore here. So I, let me take here the pencil and draw you. So here it's my identity. It is made with two cycles of length for one. Hope you are able to see. So that's my sigma one on one side. And the same for sigma two. So I'm with that example here. So the same for sigma two, right? So it's two identities that I'm trying to draw the ribbon graph associated with that. So as you see, uh, this is a cycle of length for one. So it's a vertex with only one label. So that's that vertex, for instance. So and I put the label one as in this cycle, you have the label one. So this is what I'm putting here. Second here, you have the second cycle, which is the cycle of uh, with, which contains only two. So you draw here the, the cycle of length two here, which uh, with uh, just one label, sorry, uh, which is the two. So here we go, you have this lab. Great. So you play the same game with this on the other side. And you do have for sigma two, now the same vertices here. Okay, so again, and then you join the labels. You may join labels one with one, two with two, et cetera. I hope this is clear. Um, and so that you see. So let's make something more complicated. Let's have a look about on, on this side. We can look on this side. So I have here one cycle, sigma one, made with two labels, one, two. So this is the way that you draw them in cyclic ordering, one and two labels hooked to that vertex, that black vertex. Um, on the other side, here you have the second, the second uh, permutation, sigma two, where you see here again, two labels, one and two. If you don't have uh, too many labels, it's becoming a little bit trivial, of course. But when you have more labels, it's not obvious uh, that you, you will have such a simple figure. And so let's have a look what's happening if you go in higher rank. Okay, so let's let me take three vertices. Okay, I have to clean this. Perhaps can I just move on? Doesn't want to. Okay, sorry, okay, good. Um, so here is, for instance, the vertices with, um, uh, with more vertices, uh, with more edges, sorry, n equals three. So I need to clean a little bit the, the board. There is a, a small lag between the moment that I'm annotating and the moment is diffusing. Ooh, I don't see any more my mouse. Anyway, so let me let me keep up. Look at the figure, for instance, one uh, the eleven figure below. Okay. I don't see even my mouse. Okay, so here we go. Is so let's let's focus on this uh, figure number eleven, which is right below. It is made with two cycles, one, two, three. And one, three, two. So you just list the labels, one, two, three in that order, in that cyclic ordering, and one, three, two in the other cyclic ordering. Okay, here. And then you join one label one with label one, label two and label two, uh, label three and label three, label two and label two. So in this situation, uh, you you generate 
a graph and the cyclic ordering here defines for you the embedding of the graph in the surface. Sometimes, of course, you may generate graphish genus. So for instance, this 10th graph, I hope you see my mouse because now I don't, I'm not able to draw easily on the slide. It would be more convenient to do, but I think there is an issue with that. So the 10th the graph, as you see, it's one, two, three, one, two, three, and there is now a crossing of edges that makes this 10th uh, uh, graph non-planar. So this has certainly a genus. This is a graph with genus. I hope this is clear. We can move on and I need to clean here a bit the board. Dear Joseph, you have a dustbin. You have also Sorry? sort of tr trash. Yes. So, and uh, if I'm trashing, it's doing it all, all along. Clean or drawing. Okay, great. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. This I think will, will be useful. All right. So counting, counting graphs and counting orb orbits. So as I was explaining to you, so a reborn graph is an equivalence class um, of SN cross SN under some diagonal action diagonal adjoint action on both slots. So if you are interested in, in counting how many ribbon graphs do you have, you have to count these cosets. And it is uh, straightforward by using Burnside lemma that counting orbits is counting fixed points. So you can implement the, the following formula where the delta function here is the delta function on the symmetry group telling you delta of the identity is one, otherwise that's zero. And that is the formula for counting those ribbon graphs. And you can, you can certainly uh, play uh, with your favorite program to compute how many of these number you have. So this is your sequence of number. The fourth, the four number that you see here, the fourth is because you have four guys here. And here you see you have 11 uh, pictures. That's the 11 that you see here and is going for much uh, complicated objects in higher n. All right, so this is the counting. You may ask yourself, what if you revisit the same counting under a different light, that of representation theory? Okay, so this is, if you want direct space uh, uh, computation with only, uh, sig uh, on, with only permutation and groups, what if you go to the representation theory? So the delta function, in representations actually um, develops, uh, expands in terms of the character. Okay, so this is my character R, where that dr is the dimension of your representation. So it's, uh, that's an expansion of the delta functions. R is a partition of N or a Young diagram, and that's a definition of your delta function. So here I'm just playing a trick. I'm adding a more variable in order to quickly expand them all and recognize that I'm um, in fact this counting is nothing but the sum of squares of the Kronecker coefficient. So with this small game, you are able to, to say the following. In fact, the sum of the Kronecker squares are nothing but the number of bipartite ribbon graph with n edges. All right, so this is already something that is interesting because um, you do have a combinatorial interpretation of the sum of squares. So, uh, but not yet the C by itself, but the sum of squares are indeed constructible because this, you just need to draw all these type of ribbon graph to know what is this sum of squares. All right, so, but this formula looks, looks interesting by itself. It's a sum of square. Does it have an, an interpretation? Does it have a meaning? And the answer is yes, but you need to define an algebra constructed around these, these uh, these, uh, these ribbon graph, and this is what I would like to, to explain you. We call it the graph algebra because it's an algebra made out of the graph seen as vectors. All right, so consider the group algebra C of Sn, and uh, this is just uh, the, 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 the vector space generated by linear combination of that sort, the coefficient being taken in C. And um, looking at your orbits of this equivalence relation, consider the following 
subspace of the tensor product of C of Sn times C of Sn. So the uh, tensor product of two copies of, of the group algebra C of Sn. Well, inside here, you can sum over all these elements, all the orbits, all right? So this is given a sigma one and a sigma two. You take the sum over the orbits of these, uh, the tensor product of the, 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 the two slots here, and you generate, sorry, uh, uh, you generate here uh, an algebra, a uh, vector space first, sorry, a vector space. And it's a fact that uh, that the dimension of that vector space is nothing but the number of, of, of ribbon that you have before. Why? Because I'm just having here all for each sigma one and sigma two, I'm generating, the, I'm taking the, the orbit of it. So you don't have more than these numbers of vectors. Um, in, um, you don't have more than that. Okay, so the span of it gives you the already dimension of K of N, which is this Z that we have already counted. So the second fact that you have to, to, to understand here is, so uh, you do have the ribbon graph as a geometric surface. You, it's in one-to-one -one correspondence with the orbit, an orbit, uh, that orbit, but it's now also a vector. Okay, so you have this triple correspondence between a uh, Gribbon graph orbits in C uh, in SN cross SN, but also a vector, a vector of in K of N, a, ve a vector spanning that K of N. And this, in fact, uh, this K of N is more than that. It is an algebra. You can check it in the following way: take that vector, that particular vector spanning your space, multiply it by another one, and you will see that its sum is giving you back a sum of element of that sort up to some composition here. So you are, you, the multiplication is stable. So you are in an algebra and you can even prove that this algebra is associative. A, in, uh, this is just because you, it's, it's just inheriting, uh, it's inherited from the, the fact that the, the permutation are in fact associative. So your, uh, you do have, uh, an associative multiplication, your k, and which was a vector space becomes an algebra. And as I said, there is more than that. There is a pairing on that algebra, uh, which is uh, just given by uh, this formula 14. I'm just taking, first of all, the delta on each uh, element of your, uh, the, the product of delta on your groups uh, that you extend by linearity to kn. And you can show that indeed this uh, pillionaire pairing is non-degenerate. This makes K of N a semi-simple, a semi-simple algebra. And we do have the following result. So KN is a unital, associative, semi-simple algebra. The unique is coming from the identity times the identity thing. Mm -hmm. So KN is a unital, semi-simple algebra. And there is a representation theoretic base, Q. Um, which that makes the Vedember Artin decomposition manifest. So the Vedember Artin decomposition, it's the one um, which tells you that every semi-simple algebra decomposes as a direct sum of matrix subalgebras. So this is uh, the, the fact by Vedember Artin. And now you would like to know what is the basis? What makes, what, how do you see um, the basis that make manifest that decomposition in matrix blocks? So that's that Q base that I'm, that you see here, and it is labeled by three young diagrams, and A, B below here are exactly the matrix, if you want, the, mat the entries of your matrix, the indices of the entries of your matrix. So how do you produce this base? First of all, introduce the representation base of C of Sn. So it looks like this formula 15, I'm summing over all groups element, I'm having here the uh, the so-called Wigner matrix, if you want associated, that's a representation matrix in dimension R. You sum over all these matrix elements and this produce you an element here, okay, QR, RJ, at fix R, at fix uh, label here, R, and IJ, which are also fixed. So this element, you can show that actually it's a base, it's a basis element of that of that algebra. The K, the kappa R that you see here is just a normalization factor that you use to, um, to make it autonormal or, or, or autonormal. Okay, so it's just a, a pre-factor that plays that role. How do you produce now the basis of K of N? 
So here is a generic way of doing that. So take the ordinary base of C of SN cross C of SN, the tensor product. So I'm taking two of these guys, okay? And ten, take the tensor product so that they belong to C of SN uh, or times twice. I make it invariant by acting left and right, you know, on each slot by the adjoint action on each slot. So this is already invariant, but still you do have these indices, ij, ij, and I'm using two Klebsch Gordon, two Klebsch Gordons to contract those indices. These ij, I don't want to see them uh, anymore. So I'm using here some Klebsch Gordon to neutralize this, to, to contract that. So, but you have to pay attention that on the Klebsch Gordons, of the symmetry group, you do have here a tau index. That tau index is the multiplicity. It counts the multiplicity of the tensor product um, uh, of R3, of R3 uh, inside the tensor product of R1 cross uh, R2. So you do have this multiplicity. So, and that's the multiplicity ranging from one to the conical coefficient by itself. So here is your Actually, this is a, a, you can show that this is invariant. This block here, this Q is uh, um, at fix R1, R2, R3. It's a matrix in tau one, tau two. And it's a matrix of size C, the Kronecker by itself. So that's a block decomposition. That's your block decomposition of your, your entire space, uh, the K N space. Um, kappa here that I'm putting here is again a normalization factor to make this, you know, orthogonal, uh, to make it orthonormal if you wish. Another important thing about Kn, it's in fact an Hilbert space. It supports a sesquilinear form that is non degenerate. This is your sesquilinear form, uh, nothing really uh, fancy, but uh, something really simple. You just take linear combination of uh, of in this tensor product, another uh, element in this tensor product, you just bar on one side, take the complex conjugate on one side, take the, comp the coefficient on the other side, and you know delta function of the symmetry group to, to pair the, 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 the permutation that you have left. So you can show this is again non-degenerate and you do have an Hilbert space here. There is another operator that, it, that turns out to be important in our setting, which is the conjugation. There is a conjugation or some, an involution, in fact, that we call conjugation, if you wish. And it, it runs like this, take a, a linear combination of that sort. You just need to invert the permutation here. And of course, you can check that playing this game twice, applying S on this element twice, you get back to, to, your, to, to the initial element. So you do have indeed an involution here. So now you are ready, you do have everything in place, Kn as an algebra, Kn as an Hilbert space, we can push now and define operators acting on that, on that space. And for doing this, I need um, a priori, uh, first of all, to, uh, to introduce some particular elements inside this, uh, this space. And I will, I will introduce this notation, I'm using a representative. Okay, remember that uh, each pair Tau one, tau two. You know, if you let act, um, if you act uh, uh, by adjoint diagonal adjoint action on this pair, you generate an orbit that is uh, that is that is also ribbon graph. Mm? That's that's important. So let me fix here a particular label of one of my ribbon graph. They're running from one to rib n. This is the cardinality. If you want the z of n that I have before, now I just write it like a rib n. All right, so, um, so let me take a particular representative inside this orbit and let act again, a uh, adjoint action on both slots. So you are, and you are again on the same space. Okay, so this is the same formula, but I'm just referring here with R, I'm just reporting that I'm in ribbon labeled by R. I hope it's clear. You can uh, see that you do have an automorphism subgroup of Sn leaving tau1 and tau2, the, that pair invariant. So you can recast this, this summation in terms of some of all distinct element in the orbit. Uh, you factorize now the, 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 sub, the automorphism group outside. So this is 
simple. So you, you extract the automorphins group, but this pre-factor here is by the orbit stabilizer theorem is nothing but one over the orbit. Okay, something more interesting also that this basis is in fact the previous one is orthogonal with respect to the bilinear pairing that I have already introduced. And they are orthogonal and this is your, your pre-factor, hmm? your normalization uh, factor. So let's have a look, how do multiply two of those elements? These two elements have, do have, uh, if I expand back in terms of, again, the same basis, and the coefficient here, the structure constants, T, R, S, T, C, R, S, T here, if this is what I would like to understand, how does it work? Okay, what is this number? Okay, I will play a little bit with some notations here, rather than having two tensor product here, I'm just writing it as just a sigma R. Rather than having two, two elements, two sigma one R cross sigma one, two, I just write it in that way, sigma of R, and multiplying this means I am acting on both slots. Okay, so in that sort, the previous formula looks simpler and can be written in that way or in the other way here. So now you are ready for the computation. So you let, uh, you, 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 you just compute this product, ER, ES, and what do you obtain? is the following, um, you just need to, to do a small algebra. The small steps are here. You end up with this formula 30, 23, and looks like this. So multiplying these two elements, you sum over all elements of the same kind, one over orbit of R, and a sum of a delta function acting on orbits, okay? So what is it that, what, what, is, what do you have in here? So the algebra is here, I will let, um, you know, the slide to, to, to Gerard to upload it. If people are interested on the detail of the, of the, of the steps, you, you can have it there. So, um, so let's have a look on that. What's that? So this is the orbit of all elements uh, in the orbit of R acting on the representative of ES here. And you check if this orbit has an intersection with that orbit T. So that summation that you, that you have here over this delta function counts the number of times that the multiplication of, uh, of elements from the orbit R with a fixed element in the orbit S gives you back an element in the orbit T. So it's a counting procedure here. So it's an integer and the you, and now here you see that uh, this number here is just an integer divided by this orb R that the size of the orbit. Now let's introduce our Hamiltonian uh, in uh, the, the linear operator acting on Kn that we will call Hamiltonian. So take n, k in n, okay? k could be anything from two to n. And I will write ck for the conjugacy class of some elements of C of Sn made of a single cycle of length k and all remaining cycles with length one. For instance, if I'm sticking, if I'm, if I'm just using n equals three, k equals two, c2 will have a permutation of the following form, a length, a single length of size two and one and everything else, which means here one element left uh, of size one. So this, these are there. So si a single uh, cycle of length two, cycle of length one, cycle of length two, cycle of length one. So this is C2, for instance, you may play the same game for any CK, K ranging from two to N. Now, these are interesting elements. I'm summing for all element of this class, of this conjugacy class, I'm summing all these element on this class. You can show that these elements are central, are central element in C of SN. So the first thing important is a lemma from, from uh, Kemp and Rangulam, and they're showing the following. The set T2 up to K star N, TK star N, so this is a subset, you know, of, among all the T2 up to TN that are able to generate the center of the algebra. Okay, so that's a thing that you must understand. And this KN needs not to be the N, it might be even smaller. There is a sequence, an interesting sequence of what can be Kn, but I won't be able to discuss it uh, here. So 
you do have a subset of TKs that generate the center. That's an important fact. The second fact is the basis, the basis Q that I've, I've introduced you before, I have nothing but the eigenvector of this TK operator. And what are the eigenvalue? Normalized character. So you have the character in the representation R. If you have QR, this character will be in that representation as well, divided by the dimension. I will call this ratio here the normalized character. So TK, as for eigenvector, the Q base, the representation theoretic base of the uh, group algebra, and their eigenvalue are normalized character. Uh, to prove this, you just need a uh, sure lemma and you're gonna uh, be over it. So it's not complicated to show. Now let's introduce our operator uh, on K of N. Define the following element in the tensor product C of Sn, uh, tensor C of Sn, um, and they are defined in that way. I'm taking T1K, which is the TK acting on the first slot. T2K uh, is the TK that you int I introduced before acting on the second slot this time. And T3K is the same sum over the conjugate, uh, that conjugacy class, but acting on both slots. It cannot be represented as a TK if you want, but it's almost that uh, in, in that sense. That's a the, the way of, you can write it. So these three operators are interesting. They are linear, and you can show that in fact they are, uh, uh, they are in that in that uh, uh, algebra by just multiplying on the left and on the right by proper element. You will see that you can you can show this. But what is is what is more important here is the following: T A T K here acts as linear operator on K of n. This is can be simply seen, and their matrices they do have matrices that I'm denoting like M I K T S. So when the T K acts on ES, you do have a matrix here telling you T, T, uh, uh, MIK for TIK and then TS for the, the, the element of the matrices. What is important here is these matrix elements are non-negative integers. How does it work? In fact, it's coming from the fact that the TK by themselves, they are proportional to the ER that I've introduced you before. And what is the coefficient of proportionality is nothing but the size of an orbit. So the TK is proportional to a certain R, Ki, a certain element, a certain uh, basis element that is called ER Ki. Mm? And the coefficient here is nothing but the size of the orbit. Remember before, the action of an ER on an ES gives you one of an orb, the sum of the E and the delta function. So now you immediately see that the orbit here cancels away and you do have a nice coefficient, which is an integer. So that's your matrix element here. So the matrix element that you look for, which is the matrix element of this operator acting on, on Kn, counts the number of times that this, all elements in that sum acting on a fixed orbit produce you an element in the orbit T. So this lesson we already know. Now, what is also interesting and important is that the TKI by themselves are air emission operator on K. We can play with this formula. You want to prove this formula and the steps are here. So they are integral in the sense that they are, uh, uh, their matrix are integer, have integer coefficients, but they are also air emission operators. And that is great because you can discuss now, uh, you are in, a, in an algebra, you have also in an Hilbert space, you do have air emission operator, you can discuss about quantum evolution. So you are right in a setting of quantum mechanics and this is why uh, the talk is called and our paper also referred to this setting as a quantum mechanics of, of ribbon graphs. So your ribbon graph are, are vectors and you let, can let them evolve and think about all, uh, all uh, things that are important for quantum mechanical system. Um, I won't be able to discuss more about this because I'm kind of already uh, short in time, but I'm, um, anyone who wants to discuss more about it uh, is more than welcome. So there are consequences of that and it's maybe important. The proposition that you have to see, that you have to understand is the following. So T1, T1K, T2K, T3K do have eigenvector, which is exactly 
the basis, the Vedenberg Artin basis. So you remember that was my Vedenberg Artin basis, and the TK acting on those actually produce you the characters. So how this is working? So each TK, so the T1K acts on acting on the Q, gives you the character of R1, the first slot, first slot. When the T2 acts on the Q, it gives you the character of the representation of the second slot here. And then the T3 gives you the R3, which is the third, third slots here. So uh, the T do have eigenvectors and eigenvalues which are known. How this is working? Remember the TIK are formed by the TK, okay? And the Q are formed by the QI. But you know that this one has for eigenvectors, these guys. So you understand quickly that this is going to act like that uh, on this in the same way that this is acting on that. And the proof is uh, follows uh, rather easily. So what is also important, uh, we will start by this as an input in our framework. And this is certainly an input from representation theory. So. Um, this is just to mention that, uh, for instance, if you don't, uh, you want your combinatorial proof, your combinatorial interpretation to be totally free from representation theory, well, uh, in our setting here, we do have an input, but at the end of the day, we will have a fully combinatorial uh, interpretation of, of our result. Okay, so we can move on. And another important result is that of Kemp and Rangulam, and they're telling you the following. In fact, the list of T1 uh, up to 2 through to k, a certain k star, T2 to a certain k star, T3 to a certain k star here, uniquely determines the triple R1, R2, R3. So you can, you are able with these, uh, with the eigenvalue of this operator, to uniquely speak your triple R1, R2, R3. This is important. And now because you, know, you, you will immediately see that these operator actually have an eigenspace that is exactly spanned by your Vedenberg Artin block. So this is the block that they generate, their eigenspace as uh, exactly of the, the dimension of this block, which is C squared, and that is important because you want to generate the following matrix where the M, I, K here are exactly the T, I, K matrix. If I'm subtracting the eigenvalue, be careful here, you should have an identity of the same size of this matrix. I omitted it, but you should have here an identity all for the rest here. And what is happening here is you do have this block thing uh, acting on a vector. If you, the null space of this problem is exactly the, the, the dimension of the Vedember acting block, which is of dimension C squared. Uh, it is important to know that these character, these normalized character are known combinatorially by the Murnahan Nakayama rule. So this is norm, a normalized character. We know how to extract them by a rational, by a not, rash, uh, not rational mom, but we know how to construct them using combinatorial rules. Second thing, uh, they might be even rationals, but we can choose the least common divisor, multiply by the entire setting to remove the, uh, the denominator, if you wish. And now you end up with a, a fully integral operator, which means an operator with only uh, integral, integer, positive integer uh, entries, multiplying by your sum vector and collector zero. So you know that this operator as well will do, will have. Uh, a null space of this dimension of C squared. And you've done the step one. So you have produced your operators. This operator do have a kernel and that kernel is of dimension C squared. Now, how do we extract the Kronecker? I will go quickly as I am already almost out of time. And um, so here we go. So uh, the null space of this operator has dimension C squared. In fact, for matrices with integer coefficient, there is procedure. There are procedures for being for, for, for determining their null space. And it is known that their null space actually uh, are formed by a vector generating lattices, sub-lattices, in fact, of the entire of the entire space. So how does it work? Let me just write X for the, my operator. And in fact, 
you do have the decomposition, what we call Hermit normal form, is a decomposition of your matrix into two matrices, one which is unimodular, that's my U, and the H, which is upper triangular. And the, that decomposition, the way that you proceed, is just linear, integer linear combination among the rows, swaps of rows, multiplying rows by minus one. These are allowed operations. And all these operations actually are, are, are concatenated, are, are the one that, are, that generate the U. What is important is the dimension of the null space of X counts the number of null row of H. Oh, I didn't say that. Uh, perhaps I did, H is upper triangular and is unique. So the number of null rows that are listed below, you know, in H are exactly the null space of X. The null space of X um, by itself is spanned by the, the rows of U um, corresponding to the indices of the null rows of H. So this is your null space and the entire procedure only involve uh, uh, um, uh, you know, discrete steps, something which is constructible. So you 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 may you may say that your your con your uh, construction here is integer. So you are ready for the interpretation of C square by itself. So for every triple of Young diagram with n boxes, this is your entire lattice z to the power of the number of ribbon graphs. So that's your space, and um, that lattice of linear integer coefficient of geometric ribbon graphs, geometric ribbon vector E of R in this space contained a sublative of, of dimension C squared spanned by uh, uh, integer null vectors of the linear operator L. So that's already an interpretation and a constructible way of getting C squared. But we want the Kronecker coefficient by itself. So we need another refined counting, if you want, by using now the S squared. So S, you know, divide this space. So uh, for, for the moment, this V is nothing but the vector space now associated with K of N. So I'm forgetting everything and just show you, if I'm looking at this space just as a vector space, V to the power, the, the dimension of your space, which is a rib of N, the number of ribbons. So this space decomposes in uh, the block having S as eigenvalue, S equals one as eigenvalue, or S equal minus one as eigenvalue, you have a direct sum here. And look at the Vedember art in decomposition, you do have this decomposition in this um, V-rib, R1, R2, R3, where this space is of dimension C squared. Now you can project this space, this single space on S1, and just um, the way that S acts on the Q states here, you can, you can count the number of degrees of freedom and you say that the dimension of this space is, is C, C plus one divided by two. For minus one space, you do have, you know, the dimension of the space projected on S equals minus one is C, C minus one divided by two. So uh, if you want the projection from this entire space to that vector space, you need just to stack the two matrices, okay, below the previous matrices and play the same game of the HNF construction for extracting the, no, the new null space uh, from this, uh, this block here. Now, um, you do have CC plus one, CC plus one divided by two, you do have CC minus one divided by two. How do you get uh, C? Well, it's a difference of these two numbers, or you, it's just amount to, uh, to precise, to, to make precise an injection from this space to that space. And this will give you a constructive interpretation of C. And so this is a second theorem that you achieve for every triple of Young diagram R1, R2, R3 with N boxes, there are three constructible, constructible sublattice in the entire lattice, of respective dimension, CC plus one divided by two, CC minus one divided by two, and C by itself. And this answers the question. So in conclusion, let me quickly say that uh, the, co the co coefficient is a di dimension of a constructible sublattice of in the lattice of ribbon graph here, Z rib N. The proof relies on Hermitian operator acting um, with integral eigenvalues, okay, acting on the Lilbert space, which is also an algebra built over ribbon graphs. So this entire thing could be seen as also as a quantum mechanical system. 
the HNF form, the HNF algorithm offers the lattice interpretation directly. The method that we have discussed can be generalized to other type of, uh, of uh, uh, things which are much more generalized, general than the conical coefficients. For instance, if you take um, the multiplicity of Rd in the tensor product of R1 up to Rd minus 1, so this will be uh, the generalized way of, of, uh, um, of extending the conical coefficients, you can play the same game and you will have also answers about this. And it can be also generalized to other coefficients such that the little Richardson, but for other group theoretical uh, framework. Our open problems, um, of course, they are uh, people working on combinatorial interpretation of the Konecker. We must be making contact with, with those studies um, because we know uh, what counts the Konecker for uh, all three rectangular shapes or hoop shapes or a mixture of those, but only on this specific case, you are able to, to define uh, an, a combinatorial interpretation of, of the Kronecker. So we must be uh, trying to make contact with those studies. So this must be done. But also I would like to say part of our proof relied on representation theory, perhaps in the spirit of Stanley, he doesn't like this, uh, we don't know. Um, but if you want to remove the this representation theoretical input in your in your in your framework so you need to look at again this uh, eigenvalue problem this eigenvalue thing where the tk acts on the q and you collect the um, the, uh, the normalized character times q so if we are able to provide an interpretation of the eigenvalue of tk you know that was the sum of a sigma belonging to a class without relying on this q we will be done so why, the question is why the TK, uh, the eigenvalue of the TK satisfy the Monahan Nakayama rule. If we could answer this, well, the entire setting will be fully combinatorial and we will, um, we will be able to give a full combinatorial proof for the chronic equation. So thank you for your attention. I will stop there. Thank you, dear thank Joseph. You. Are there questions? Maybe Darij had questions, maybe, no? Uh, no, actually, I, this, this was resolved in the chat. Okay. Ah, okay, so there are a few questions on the chat. Maybe I can address this. Um, somebody, okay. Is, is, okay, is the multiplication of C of sin generated from and it is a tensor product, tensor product, C of Sn, tensor C of Sn. Yes, yes, yes. Our oh, Sanjay is there and already answers it. Okay. I have a question. Go uh, ahead. It is about uh, the um, the conjugacy classes of uh, type n minus one one. So hold on. I think my presentation has disappeared. Yes, uh, it has. It has. Okay, sorry. So I need to reboot it again. Sorry. So let me go back to that. So I, maybe I can... Yes, hold on a second. Let me try to reboot it. I've experienced some trouble here. So let me put full screen first. Yes. Uh... Your uh, T1, yes. T, your T2, 2 T, K star N. Uh, yes. Which are conjugacy, conjugacy classes of type N minus 1, 1, because you have a subcycle of lengths N minus 1 and a fixed point. Okay, so hold on, Gerard. So you. <laughs> Yes. So come again, your question, please. Yes. Your, your elements T2 uh, until T K star oh. N. Yes, yes. Keep are, up. Are, yes. Uh, I have not. My question is uh, that uh, Antonio Maki, maybe you know of him. He made the work uh, many, many times ago, uh, not proving that it is uh, uh, 
I think not proving that it, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, I, I think not proving that it generates the center, but it is pre preparing this uh, proposition uh -huh. because these, these classes, the, the TK, uh, are uh, multiplicative. If you multiply two of them, you find a sum of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of other, uh, if you consider the Z module uh, generated by the CK, up to my, my remembrance, mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, uh, closed by, by, by multiplication. Uh, do, do you know this work? It is, I think, uh, the work of Maki, you say? Yes, Antonio Maki. Antonio Maki. From um, La Sabienza. I didn't know personally, I didn't know about it, but I think it's, it's right as the center is stable. So you, what you say is, is yes, entirely yes. right. Yes, yes. As the center is stable. So if you multiply this, you're going to end up there oh, as well. Of course, yes. of course, now you know more that yes. you can say that uh, his work of 20 years ago uh, yes. can be deduced from this work. Now, I, I, I am just pointing you Yes, work. yes. It's maybe not so complete, but important uh, to cite in the bibliography. So, Antonio Maki, yes. Antonio so Maki, La Sapienza, and I can uh, try to recover the paper. Okay. Because it was uh, an idea of Professor Schutzenberger. Okay. So, can can so, I make a quick comment? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, so, so, just, you know, so in general, the a linear basis for the center is given by T sub P, where P is a, uh, a partition of N. Yes. Uh, here, this set sort of uh, selects out those partitions which have one cycle of length two and remaining cycles of length one, that's the T2, or T3, which is one cycle of length three, remaining cycles of length one. So it just, there's only at most N minus one of these guys. Uh, so it's a subset of all the partitions. But if you take these guys and take products of them, you generate the whole thing, which is linearly spanned by all partitions. So it's a rather small subset in a, in a bigger center of SN. So, but we will be happy to have a look at that paper, certainly. Okay, yes, but uh, it was just a, a pointer. It, it does not uh, withdraw nothing of your merit, you know. Oh, yes. Sir. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this nice talk.